You are listening to She Rises, a podcast dedicated to women who are ready to stop settling and start living their lives by design. If you're ready to talk about the stuff that weighs you down and get practical advice on everything from your health, body image, spirituality, relationships, and personal growth, then you're in the right place. Hello, I'm Giovanna Capoza, your host, master coach, spiritual teacher, and mind-body expert, and I'm on a mission to unsettle women all over the world. Are you ready to rise? Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode. My name is Giovanna Capoza and you're listening to She Rises. Thanks so much for coming back. I really do appreciate you listening week to week. I super, super appreciate you sharing these episodes on social media and sharing them with your friends. Um, If you haven't already done so, go to iTunes or Google Play Music, give us a rate and review and let people know how much you're enjoying the show. Well, without further ado, I want to introduce today's guest. We are going to be talking about one of my favorite topics, and you guys know this if you've been listening to the show for a while, weight loss, body image, self-love, food, relationship to food, nurturing yourself, all of these things. We've talked about them before. I've had several guests on the show around this topic, and I've shared transparently with you guys my own struggles around my body image and my weight loss journey and weight gain journey and all of that. And it's really a topic near and dear to my heart because so many women and men use this um, you know, body image or lack thereof and foods. We, we use this as such a, as a, such a way to, you know, punish ourselves. And really what I want people to understand and know that this is all just a symptom. They're all just signposts pointing you in the direction of the deeper work. And that's why I'm so excited to have Carly Pollock on the show today. She's the author of a fabulous new book called Feed Your Soul. I hope you guys go pick up a coffee. She's also the founder of Nutritional Wisdom, which is a thriving private practice based in Austin, Texas. She's a certified clinical nutritionist with a master's degree in holistic nutritionist. So you know as a fellow holistic nutritionist, I'm going to love her. This conversation's great. I hope you guys dive in and get a lot out of it. And of course, being as short as it is, 30 minutes, um, pick up the book. You'll get so much more from the book. And hey, let's continue the conversation on social media. You can find me on Facebook. Follow me on Instagram at she underscore rises underscore podcast. And let's continue the conversation there. Enjoy the episode. Hey, Carly. Welcome to the show. I am beyond excited to have you on, another uh, fellow uh, holistic nutritionist and practitioner, and especially someone who just knows this story of body and food. And, um, you know, it's it's where my greatest lessons have been in this life and continue to be. And I'm so happy to have you on. Welcome. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think I know I know that story a little too well. Right? I know. I tell people that all the time. So, <laughs> you know, let's dive in. I'm I'm so curious for the audience to really get to know um to get to know you. I'm curious to know more about you myself, um, having the book in front of me here, which is wonderful, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, tell us a little bit about how it is that you got to where you are today with writing this book and your journey through, you know, really your relationship to food and your body. I always loved food. (laughs) Even as a young child, I was very into food. I had scratch and sniff food stickers that I (laughs) loved. I loved watching the Ninja Turtles. I loved that they loved pepperoni pizza. It was, it was a thing ever since I was a child and I wasn't overweight as a child, but I was very anxious as a child. I had a lot of anxiety. I was, I was a self inflicted perfectionist. I remember my parents would continue to say to me, you know, I don't know where you get this from, this stress, you just do the best you can. But for me, it was like, I had to get all A's. I had to get one hundreds. And I was, I was a very delicate little flower as a child. And then as I hit puberty, I started to gain weight and my anxiety really manifested, you know, school was at a higher level. Now we're looking at high school and, and starting to look into college and the, you know, mix of the two really created this need for me to have some sort of outlet. And because I always loved food, it was food, but because my body image was now a thing, you know, here I am, I'm now a teenager. I'm interested in boys. Mm -hmm. I have now a fully formed ego Mm -hmm. where I'm 
constantly wondering about what other people are thinking of me, I think that sets the stage for poor body image. When you have a love for food, it's the outlet for how you shift emotion. You're gaining weight because you're going through puberty and you're extremely identified and hyper aware of how other people are viewing you. It's like a perfect storm. Oh, yes. I know that storm. And, and, you know, it's sad, but I, I would say probably nine out of 10 women listening to this, if not 10 out of 10, have had some version of that storm. And it's so difficult to navigate as a young child. And then, I mean, really, you just end up carrying a lot of that baggage with you into adulthood. So no wonder, you know, we have this struggling relationship. So yeah, take us a little bit further forward and, and how you, you know, healed that within yourself. I remember, I don't know where I heard it, but I remember hearing a quote at one point that was that we teach what we most need to learn. And I feel like we've, you know, heard that said at one point or another, especially if we're on a spiritual journey. And I really feel like that, you know, I am now teaching what I most needed to learn in my life. And I look back in hindsight and say, oh, I know why all of that suffering happened because it's bringing me here and allowing me to be a true expert. It's so hard when we're in that moment of chaos to recognize trust and surrender that out of this only good will come. So anyone listening right now that might actually be in the chaos and going through something really hard, just trust that this is going to be laying the groundwork for how you shine even brighter, you know, in the future. But it, it, the obsession with food and wanting to figure it out for myself and wanting to help other people, it was kind of a no brainer to go into this type of work. And I was one of those people that was extremely fortunate that very young, I knew what I wanted to do. So I went to school and got my a bachelor's degree in nutrition. And then I went right away and got my master's degree in holistic nutrition. And I've just been on that path ever since. Yeah. And it's interesting, like your, your love of food still, you know, pull the, pull the thread all the way through, right? To your whole life and studying nutrition. But now it's not just the food. Now it's like learning yourself, but also teaching other people how to truly nourish themselves, which is what I really love about your book and, and your message, because, you know, so many of us, myself included, at a very young age, obsessing about food and my weight and my body image and just using that as the external thing, um, which was really, and I say this all the time, I mean, it's all of it is just a symptom of what's going on inside. So talk to us a little bit about that, because w there is this huge component and I would say it's probably 99% of it is like your inner work, right? But we, we spend so much time focusing on like, how much weight did I lose? What's the number on the scale? What did I eat today? Let me log it in. And we make ourselves nuts. There's no two ways about it. Your plate is a reflection of your inner state. I say that Love all it. the time. And partly because I very much enjoy rhyming. And I love a good because, rhyme. It's so good for Partly because I just really love a good <laughs> rhyme. You can tell that I'm the life of the party. And partly because, <laughs> and very much because it is so true. And there is this, uh, I don't know if you've had this experience, but when I first started coaching people, and this was, uh, you know, almost 15 years ago, I was just like any other nutritionist or practitioner or doctor, I was entrenched in behavior modification. So people came to see me and I said, okay, do this, don't do that, eat this way, don't eat this, drink this, don't drink this, modify your behavior, go do what I said, and then, you know, you'll have all the reward that you could possibly ask for. And what would happen is that these people would go and do this plan, just like most of us can do anything when we're in enough pain, whether it's emotional pain or actual physical pain. And they'd come back and they'd have the reward. They lost weight. They feel better, less anxious, whatever it was. We'd high five. I would teach them something new. And eventually, 100% of the time, they would come back and say, I stopped doing that thing you told me to do. And now I'm, quote unquote, off the wagon and I need help. And it was at that time that I realized, holy crap, this Making permanent change in your life really has nothing to do with food or having anything to do with the very change you're making. 
if you don't know how to control the voice in your head, if you don't have mental tools in order to create an authentic desire for you to wake up day in and day out. And what I mean by authentic desire is you wake up, you can't wait to eat healthy. You're so excited to go to that workout. Not it's, it's a force cause you're scared. If you don't do it, what will happen? But if people don't have the tools for that, they'll never make something permanent. And it was at that moment that I had these clients coming to me saying, I need help. And I don't, I didn't have the tools. I would just look at them and go, Oh, you really need to do that thing you were doing before that was creating so much reward. And it was really mirroring what was going on in my own life. You know, when I was at the very beginning of my career, I was yo-yoing as well. I was on and off. I ate like a warrior during the week. And then I broke out of food prison and had reckless abandonment during the weekend. And so my clients were really just mirroring what was going on in my own life. And at that point I said, you know what? I have enough nutrition information. I have a master's degree in nutrition. I'm a certified clinical nutritionist. I need to start studying the psychology of the mind and I need to do it through a spiritual lens. And that was really the hugest turning point for me in my career. I thank you for sharing that. I mean, it's, it's, and I want everyone listening. Like it's, it's not about the food. It's not even about how you look. It's not even about the number on the scale. I mean, at a certain point, at probably my lowest point in, you know, past relationship and my mom was dying and then passed away. I was like at my heaviest, heaviest weight. And I, I did the behavior modification, right? I did the diet. I did the thing. I lost 70 pounds. I was looking great, feeling great. I was doing all of that. I still wasn't happy. I still wasn't happy with my body. I was still nitpicking at things. As a result of that, I ended up, you know, putting on a little bit of weight that I lost. Um, It's never enough. And it's, and I really want people listening. These are all just symptoms like your weight and the way you look in your jeans and all the way you feel about your body. It's all just a symptom of something deeper that's going on. And it's, I love that you brought that in because it's not about behavior modification because it will come back. And even if it doesn't come back, you still won't feel like you're enough. And you know, Um, you just said that's so amazing that I had an experience, which is the same experience, total opposite pendulum swing. I feel like when people are sad, they're either eaters or non-eaters. And so you mentioned, you know, being an eater and gaining 70 pounds. I'm a non-eater when I'm super, super upset. Uh, in the past, I just couldn't even think about food. I remember going through a breakup, being so incredibly heartbroken. I have this um, memory that's so strong that is makes me even emotional to talk about it. I was sitting on my sister's couch, my best friend, and I couldn't eat and I hadn't eaten for days. And she made me a smoothie and literally had to take the smoothie straw up to my mouth. Like I was, I was comatose. I was so heartbroken and I had gotten down. I think I was 115 pounds. Like I was so, so thin. And I remember looking in the mirror and for a moment I was like, wow, I can't like my body looks great right now. And I am so effing miserable and depressed. And it was this moment of like, wow, my whole life, I, my mind was telling me this false story that I call it the when I, then eyes, when I have this, then I will feel this way. Mm -hmm. And it was like, when I have that flat stomach and when I'm thin enough that the cellulite on my thighs has reduced because let's be honest, it's never going away, but it had (laughs) really, when it, when it reduces, that I will then feel happy. And I was like, wow, I'm here, but I don't feel happy at all. This doesn't matter to me and how depressing it is that I just went through a breakup and no one's going to even see this work of art naked. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, exactly. But it was, you feel but it was like the so opposite. Bad. Yeah. It was the opposite end of the spectrum. And this is the same thing with eating disorders, whether you're binging or not eating. I mean, it's, it's this, it's not about what we think it's about, but it can manifest in wildly different ways. Yeah. And let's talk about, let's talk a little more about that because it doesn't, again, like you were, you were, you were super skinny and it's the same experience for me. Like when I ended up losing the 70 pounds and I was at a weight, like I was at a weight and my body looked great. I was in the best shape of my life. I like outside, I looked good, right? Outside, it looked good. But inside I was like, 
this isn't good enough. I need to lose another 10 pounds. And he, so it's this obsession with, like you mentioned at the beginning, perfection or like if, you know, when I arrive here, then I'll be worthy enough, right? And so let's talk about body shaming in our culture. And and I love your approach to the word diet in the book. Talk to us a little bit about that. You know, you have two schools of thought right now, which are really interesting to me. You have the school of thought, which is really the anti-body shaming, which is, you know, love yourself exactly where you are. You know, we have a, a kind of like a big is beautiful or every everybody has a different body. And then you have the other school of thought, which is, you know, just do this 30 day whole 30, you know, challenge and, and, you know, get to the best body that you could possibly have. And I obviously agree that body shaming or not being okay with where you are is a complete waste of time. It's the very thing that blocks you from getting where you need to be. But I have a different approach. My thought process is you need to be happy where you are because that's where you are. And you cannot argue against where you are. That creates a resistance and resistance will never get you to where you want to be. So you have to first accept here is where I am. I am enough. It is okay because it is where it is. And then it's working on that self-love and, and holding yourself to an accountability level that you say, you know what? I deserve more than this. Not because I want so-and-so to look at me in a bathing suit and think I'm okay, or because I want to post this picture on social media, but because I want to look in the mirror every morning and say, I did this, that my physical body is a reflection of how much I love and care about myself. And so it's, it, it, I really take some, a different stance. I don't want you to just be overweight and say, oh, okay, I'm just going to love myself as I am because my fear for that is that it's not healthy and that you will not live as long or that you will not feel as energetic or that your hormones will not be as balanced. And so your quality of life will not be where you deserve it to be. I love the idea of loving yourself, accepting yourself, but then use that to motivate to say, you know what? I deserve more. Yeah. I've said it a million times because I've lived it, right? Like you can't you can't hate yourself into loving yourself, right? Like you can't, you can't actually hate on yourself so much that you change. And then once you change, then I'll love myself because, you know, again, referencing what I said before, like it doesn't work. Like it's an and inside yeah, you job. Can't, you can't hate yourself skinny. You cannot hate yourself skinny. You can for a little bit and then it'll just pile right back on because you still hate yourself. <laughs> oh my goodness. I cannot tell you how many times in college you're just reminding me by saying that, that I would have a weekend, you know, that was debaucherous in some way food wise. I was honestly, I was never, you know, I got sober pretty early in my life. I was never a drug person. Uh, food. Yeah, I, food's been the drug still of choice. To say I'm a foodie. Um, you know, food was my drug and, and now it's shopping, but, um, so food was my drug of choice and I would wake up on a Monday and I would hate myself to the treadmill, you know, um, to say, okay, you, I would get on the treadmill and I would be exhausted and tired and the mind would come on and say, yeah, you, this is what you deserve. This is your punishment for eating so crappy this weekend, like this feeling you have, you deserve this. And then some go faster. <laughs> and, it, and people do think that that type of fear and negativity creates the force they want. But we know that ultimately only love creates change, not fear. So how do we do this? Like practically speaking, you know, someone is listening to this and they're like, that's amazing. Um, you know, for those of you listening, we're going to have the link in the show notes, but the, the book is called Feed Your Soul, Nutritional Wisdom to Lose Weight Permanently and Live Fulfilled. What practically speaking, you know, someone's listening to this and they're like, yeah, that's totally me. You know, I know that my weight or even if it's even if they don't have a weight problem, because I also want to say that for people listening, like this isn't about you having a weight problem. You could be you can be completely slim and have an issue with food. In fact, a lot of slim people, most of the slim people I know, they still have some kind of issue around food. So this isn't just relegated to people that have, you know, 
some fat to lose. Or, oh no, or, you you could be skinny and black and rotting on the inside. We all know that. Totally right. So I just want to make that clear for everyone listening. Um, so not just for the us chunky girls out there, but mm-hmm. for you know for people listening and they're like, okay, I'm gonna get the book. This is amazing. I know that my relationship to food and eating is a symptom of something internal. It's a symptom of something deeper. What do we do? How do how do we get to the next stage? How do we change this? <laughs> Taking action is starts with creating a vision. And I know that when we say take action, people really want to hear like, okay, so wait, how many times should I go to the gym? And what exactly right. should what are be the on my steps? <laughs> <laughs> right. And and I do dedicate a chapter in the book to telling people exactly what I feel they should do and how to learn your body's language so that you're not just doing some generalized program or the Carly program, because it worked for me. So now I'm going to write a book and tell all of you to do that. But I, I dedicate a chapter into, you know, how do you listen to your body and figure out what is that, what type of food you should be eating. And, and I give some guidance there, but truly before you take that type of physical action and get in the kitchen and, and plan your workouts and whatever, you have to take mental action. There's a formula I go over in the book that I reference so much throughout the book and throughout my coaching and all of my teachings. And that formula is that our thoughts drive our emotional state, which is how we feel and how we feel drives our behaviors. So thoughts drive emotions, emotions dictate our behaviors. If we're trying to change a behavior around food, then we need to change our emotion around it. The way to do that is to change our thoughts. So the very first thing you need to do to take action is I would say, whip out a notebook and write at the top thoughts I think about weight loss, thoughts I think about my body, thoughts I think about how easy it is to lose weight, thoughts I think about cooking, about exercise, about going to sleep on time, and just write down you know, this kind of vomit on the page and don't judge yourself and don't try to edit it and just write down all your unconscious, subconscious, or conscious thoughts about these things. Because what people are going to notice is, Ooh, I have some crappy stories around this and no wonder why I can't do this consistently. So let me give you an example. Uh, I've always been one of those people and I know I, I, everyone can hate me because I, I hate me for being this annoying, but I'm just one of those people that really loves exercise. <laughs> and when you ask me, I'm hearing all the, Oh, uh, and gross. People in the car groaning, right? What yeah. a bitch. Yes. So, um, you know, when you ask me what's my story around exercise or thoughts, I think about exercise, you know, the things that come to mind for me are, Oh, I love that. I love sweating. I love that feeling of being so exhausted after, because I know that I really pushed it. But at the same time, I feel energetic. I love feeling sore. I love the music. I love the whatever it's that I've attached pleasure my stories are are pure pleasure. Now let's talk to someone who hates exercise and they're going to go, Oh God, I hate having to blow dry my hair after my hair gets all messed up. I hate feeling sore. I hate that feeling of the burn, but I always have to do so much laundry and, and their stories are going to attach pain to that. Well, what's the difference? Person A, me, I work out consistently. Person B forces themselves to work out when they feel fat, but other than that, cannot keep it consistent. And is it really about the workout, which is the behavior? No, it's about our stories. How and I know it sounds when you're doing it, it right? How you feel when you're doing it, but how you feel when you're doing it is driven by what you think before you do it. Absolutely. Is it coming from a place where I'm punishing myself and I'm forcing myself and I hate it and oh, versus I'm doing something good for me. And even this idea of, let's say someone thinks of exercise and goes, oh, I hate that burn. Well, why don't we change the story to when I feel that burn, I know that I'm adding years to my life. My legs are getting stronger. I am going to feel more energy from this. This is going to help me you know, lose weight if that's what I need to do or sleep better tonight. And attaching those pleasurable stories is what gets you to do the behavior. Now, I do want to say one thing because a lot of the time there, it's really hard to attach pleasurable stories to doing something that's good for us, like scooping the kitty litter, or maybe for somebody else that's exercise or cleaning dishes. 
if you're having trouble shifting the story in the moment to one that is pleasurable, then there's another option for you, which is not to mess with the story, but to think about the outcome. You really have two components when you're engaging in some sort of healthy activity. And that is you have the process of what it takes to do that thing. And then you have the outcome of what you're going to receive once you do that thing. The process inevitably is going to be hard. Anything in your life that's really, really worth it, the process is hard. And let's just take food out of it for a second. What about going to college and getting that degree, being pregnant to you know create a family, raising children, working, marriage, relationships? Think about the process of it at times is going to be really difficult, but the outcome is so fantastic and amazing and it's what we live for. So if if there's anything I'm doing where I'm really stuck in the process, I try to keep my focus on the outcome and, and all that pleasure that I attach to the outcome is what gets me through the day to day muck of it. Yeah. And it reminds me of in the book when you talk about, um, so there's a, a couple, um, principles. Like, so you talk about the difference between, willpower and discipline which is sometimes a really ugly word for people and this idea that when you when you do create boundaries around food in a healthy way not in a restrictive I'm punishing myself way but in a healthy way out of self-love and self-care that you actually create more freedom and I wonder if you can talk about that a little bit more so I I coined this term I make up a lot of stuff I love it me too I make up words all the time (laughs) And I really thought about that there are these two levels of food freedom. And the first level, which is quite unenlightened and really surface and basic, is, oh, yeah, I have food freedom. I can eat whatever I want. I have no rules. Free to eat fries. Free to eat chips. Woo! And that this level of food freedom creates body prison because – Eating whatever we want ultimately is not going to give us, you know, what we want. We're trained to seek short-term pleasure. I love junk food. I love fried food. I'm not the type of person, you know, I love kale too, but let's be real. I I love a good cookie. So, (laughs) And if you deep fry the kale, then it's even better, right? (laughs) And if you deep fry the cookie, I am on board. (laughs) So, (laughs) um, So that's this first surface level of food freedom. The next deeper, more enlightened level of food freedom is to say, you know what? I can have these foods. I'm free to have these foods. I choose not to. Maybe at this day, but not at this day. But for the most part, I choose not to. And that higher level of of food freedom is really body freedom. And when you're in that piece of food freedom or that level of food freedom, it may look like from the outside that you have all these boundaries and rules around food. Oh, I'm dairy free, gluten free, soy free, corn free, whatever. But I have felt more free in my life having more restriction with my food because the way I look at it has changed. I am choosing not to eat these foods because I have clarity about what I want. And you mentioned something about having these loving boundaries or I, or, or, or these gentle, you know, boundaries around food again, with the whole body positive or versus body shaming, there's also this kind of diet anti diet thing happening right now. And there's so many people out there that are, that are so anti diet and saying, you know, diets don't work. And I agree diets without a spiritual practice are absolute chaos. They do not work diets where you are not looking at the deeper meaning and looking at your thoughts do not work. But let's be real. Most of us need to be on some sort of food protocol, diet, diet's just a word for how we eat, but some sort of food protocol where there's some restriction of some sorts. I cannot eat dairy if I want to poop every single day. <laughs> and if unless I want to feel three months pregnant at the end of the night, I can't eat gluten either. And I talk about in the book, like, I don't know why these these foods don't like me and what I did to them, but whatever, I'm not in their club. And recognizing that this is just not a food that feels good to my body. My body communicates to me all the time, hey, I don't like this. It doesn't mean I never eat it. If I'm in New York and I'm eating a slice of pizza and dealing with the consequence and totally happy. But for the most part, everybody needs to be on some 
food protocol that has boundary. So instead of feeling like, oh, I, uh, diets are bad, and but then I feel chaotic because I don't know what I'm eating, it's really about finding what works for you and then having that idea of that higher level of food freedom. Yeah, and it's about like I what I got from what you just said there. It's about not making those boundaries restrictions, right? So it's not it's about not making the boundaries like a bad thing like oh, I can't eat that and that's bad for me or if the, you know when you do go to New York and have the pizza that you're like, "Oh my god, I shouldn't be eating this. I'm going to feel so bad after I eat this." You know, I'm going to have a like bloated belly. It's literally choosing things out of self-love and self-care and you know, I want to go back to this idea for people listening, like if you are struggling with body image and weight and all of these things, it really is just a symptom of a deeper thing going on. And so you can have all the boundaries you want around food, like you were suggesting, Carly. And if what I got from your book, which is why I love it so much, is that there's a, this deeper spiritual component that you talk about, which is what's going on. I remember you know, when I had gained all that weight um, and I had I was carrying weight from before as well, when I lost the 70 pounds, I had to go through this really, this metamorphosis within myself. I had to notice all the times I was using food to comfort. Um, and it was rigorous. And so I love that you bring that in. Like diet is just the way we eat. It's just your lifestyle. And there's this spiritual component underneath that that doesn't feel like I'm restricting my life you know like I'm actually healing myself it's it's you're so right it's really the energy that you bring to anything in life forget food it's the energy you bring to any thought any place you go any person you interact with if the and what I mean by energy is it's really your emotional state. Are you high energy? Or are you low energy? Are you positive or negative? When I think of the boundaries that I've created around food, I feel good about them. I feel safe. You know, they make me feel safe. When I go out to eat, I know I'm not going to eat that bread basket because when I was in clarity about the vision of what I wanted for my body, my health, my life, I said, you know what? Only twice a week are you going to eat something that is purely, you know, for pleasure, for taste pleasure. Uh, and then the other times of the week, you're going to follow this protocol that makes you feel really good. So I feel good when I go out. It's like, oh, I'm not eating that right. And, you know, I mentioned something that's really important for people. And one of the biggest killers of permanent change is this black and white thinking and this food scarcity that creates that black and white thinking, which is we make foods bad and we make them scarce. And the biggest example I've seen of food scarcity is Thanksgiving. We take these foods that we love, that we all love, and instead of making them you know, once every six weeks, we make some stuffing. No, we've decided we're only going to eat this once a year for some inane reason. I have no clue. And you're going to you binge know. on it until you feel. Of course, because you can only have it once a year. So people know I'm not going to be able to eat this for an entire year. Just like when we go on vacation and it's like, when will I be back to Italy? I need to eat all of the pizza and gelato I can possibly <laughs> get my hands on. <laughs> and you know, I've never done that, Carly. I don't know yeah, what you're talking mm -hmm, about. <laughs> uh-huh. Me neither. <clears throat> um, and it's so interesting to me. It's like you, what if you make stuffing in February? That's inappropriate. Don't eat p pumpkin pie in January while everybody's cleansing. That's weird. And something that I do to undo the food scarcity of the holidays is the month before Thanksgiving, once a week, and I've done this for years, I make a Thanksgiving themed meal. And by the time, so it's like maybe one day I'm making, um, a salad that has turkey and cranberries and whatever, and I will make a side of stuffing or some mashed potatoes and some um, brisket in the crock pot and a cranberry sauce. And by the time Thanksgiving comes, it's like I'm over it. It's just a meal. So exactly. I have my it's meal. Like, Meh, who cares? I've taken the scarcity away. And so one of the biggest things that I do for myself is twice a week, I allow myself two free meals, not free days because that's obsessive, but two free meals where I can eat whatever I want. And that's like the foodie in me, French fry. I had French fries last night, you know, potato chips, pizza, a Chinese food at a restaurant, or just going and dining and not worrying. Does this have gluten? Does this have dairy or how much sugar is in this? Enjoying a beautiful dessert at a restaurant. 
because I don't want any food to be off limit. That will make it have an energy of scarcity for me. And then when I do get my hands on it, I'm going to eat 10 times as much. Yeah, well said, well said. Well, guys, there's so many other amazing tips and tools in this book. I hope you guys pick it up. It's called Feed Your Soul. Carly, it was so great to have you on. Uh, We could probably talk for another hour, I'm sure. I know. um, With both of our experiences and and just, um, yeah, this journey around food and body image for women and men. You know, it's it's the same with men. Um, It's just, it's a really intense one. And I'm glad to have you on. I'm glad that Um, people got a chance to hear your message and uh, pick up the book, guys. It's a good one. Thanks for being on the show, Carly. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for tuning in and keep rising, everyone. For books and resources related to today's episode, make sure you head over to SheRisesPodcast.com and I'll see you there. If you've enjoyed today's episode, make sure you tune back in next week when I dive into more juicy topics to help make your life the best it can be. And hey, if you've enjoyed listening to the show and you love it, head on over to iTunes and leave me a rate and review and subscribe there to the show. 